Fantastic. Uh, we are so excited to welcome everyone this evening. Um, you have joined us for a really special event tonight. So tonight's event is sponsored by UConn's Institute for Collaboration on Health, Intervention, and Policy. Um, you probably know it better as INCHIP, which brings together individuals with diverse scientific clinical and methodological expertise and supports their evolution into collaborative investigators who conduct innovative and interdisciplinary research that impacts public health and well-being. So INCHIP's Mind Body Health Research Interest Group aims to provide our community members with meaningful workshops to learn strategies to support overall health and well-being. That is our purpose tonight. Um, before we get started with the presentation, I'll pass it over to Dr. Melissa Bray to introduce the Mind Body Health Board members. Thank you, Sierra. First, I want to thank Sierra. She is a doctoral uh, candidate in school psychology, and she has uh, served on our board as a student representative and has been instrumental in setting up tonight's event. So thank you, Sierra. Also on the board is Dr. Uh, Sandra Butchmick. She's an associate dean and professor emeritus, and that is within the School of Agricultural Health and Natural Resources. We also have Dr. Mary Guerrera. Happy to have her. She is a physician, also an emeritus professor from Family and Integrated Medicine in the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. And um, I'm Melissa Bray. I am a professor and I direct the school psychology program. And we've been working together as a group. We also have a past member who stepped down from our board, but I'd like to recognize Anna Verissimo, who is also a physician and um, has been retired from the Connecticut Children's Medical Center. So that said, we're happy to have uh, the speaker tonight and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Sierra, to um, introduce the speaker. So Yep, so next we have Sandy. She is going to open our space for this event this evening. Okie dokie. Um, so um, as well as my other uh, academic credentials, I've been studying energy medicine for uh, quite a few years now. And so um, uh, a North American uh, traditional indigenous type of uh, energy medicine. And as part of that, what we usually do when we're going to have a, a a meeting or a training or a ceremony, we open space to invite spirit, whatever you envision spirit to be. It can be within yourself, it can be nature, whatever you think, um, to join us and be with us and, and um, you know, make our learning um, optimal. So here we go. <clears throat> to the winds of the south. Great serpent, wrap your coils of light around us. Teach us to shed the past the way you shed your skin all at one time. Teach us to walk softly on the earth. Show us the beauty way. Aho. To the winds of the west, mother, sister, jaguar, protect our medicine space. Show us the way beyond death the way across the rainbow bridge. Teach us to walk with impeccability and integrity through the forest, through the jungle. Show us the way of fearlessness. Aho. The winds of the north, hummingbird, grandmothers, grandfathers, ancestors, ancient ones, lineage. Come warm your hands by our fires. Come whisper to us in the wind. We honor you who have come before us and you who will come after us, our children's children. Aho. To the winds of the east, great eagle condor, come to us from the place of the rising sun. Teach us to fly wing to wing with great spirit. Show us the mountains we only dare to dream of. Show us the high view where everything mundane goes poof. Aho. Mother Earth, Pachamama, we come here to honor all your children. The stone people, the plant people, the water people, the air people, the fin, the furred, the feathered, 
the scales, the two-legged, the four-legged, the many-legged, the no-legged, the creepy crawlers, the winged ones, all our beloved brothers and sisters, all our beloved relations. Ha ho. Grandfather, son, grandmother, moon, star nation, star brothers, star sisters, great spirit, you who are known by a thousand names, yet you who remain the unnameable one. Thank you, thank you, thank you for letting us come together in this beautiful place at this beautiful time for one more day. Aho. I'm done. <laughs> thank you so much for that, Sandy. That's something I always enjoy at the start of our events together. So now I have the honor of introducing tonight's speaker, Dr. Klaus Anderson. So Dr. Anderson is the Paul and Rennet Madsen Professor of Scandinavian Studies at the Department of German, Nordic, and Slavic at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. As a native Dane, he teaches and conducts research on different aspects of Scandinavian literature and cultures. He has just finished a book-length project on the Norwegian author Carl Uva Nosgaard and the auto-fictional novel, and his next project is on the fairy tales of Hans Christian Andersen. So now I am so excited to hand it over to Dr. Anderson. Thank you so much, Sierra. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for being here, and thank you for, for, for having me. Um, my talk today will be about Hugo and heaviness, but as you might be were able to hear from Sierra's introduction, I am mainly a literary scholar and cultural critic. That means that when I talk about Hugo today, I do it as a cultural phenomena. And when I talk about happiness, as, as I do it as a novice or a certainly a non-expert in it. But my mar argument is here that we can connect these two things and that they are uh, interrelated uh, somehow. Uh, the very first thing I would like to do today um, is, is something I always do if, if I teach, and hopefully the importance of why I want to do this will become apparent a, a little uh, later in, in, in my talk and our uh, workshop here today. Um, I would like to put all of the you participating here and listening into uh, some um, uh, discussion groups um, and just spend a minute or two getting to know each other in these groups and then talk about your reasons for coming. And then if you know the concept of Hugo, and if so, share with each other what you know about the concept. And I will ask Sierra now to put you into groups and you will be put into groups. I encourage you to turn on your camera, talking to each other a little bit. And then in about two, three minutes, we will meet back here uh, and I will continue, start my presentation on Hugo and happiness. I hope that sounds okay with everyone and does not scare any of you uh, away. <laughs> Excellent. This is a great way to start our event with some connections. So I am going to be putting participants into breakout rooms now. And you should be getting a notification to join your breakout room.
So yeah, thank you, Sierra. So let's just give it a couple of minutes. Yes, absolutely. It's the same when you're like, especially during the pandemic, right? When you were teaching and you did breakout rooms, you knew exactly the students were not there because they did not accept going into a bed, like. I know. And then some groups didn't have me. So I just moved some people around just to make sure that there's at least three people in a group. So yeah, we'll give it a couple more minutes and then we'll break it back. Could you see how many were are here? So we have 41 people here. Okay. I hope this does not scare any of them away. So. This is this is a nice conversation to start off the night with. This is great. So so far we've been in breakout rooms for about three minutes. Maybe give it a couple more minutes just so they have time to share. Yeah, let's give 30 more seconds would be. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And then let's <clears throat> We started doing this actually uh, at our at our faculty meetings in, in in my department. We I'm on the climate and diversity committee, and when you typically give reports what you discuss, and what we started to do instead is to do exercises where people get to talk to each other, and it completely changes the the whole atmosphere. Like you just have three minutes to sit and talk to a colleague about something, and then afterwards everyone seems a little happier. <laughs> Isn't it amazing what a little connection can do yeah. for people? <laughs> okay, so I am going to uh, bring everyone back now. So it's been about four minutes. Okay. All right, so this gives them a one minute countdown and they all come back. So this will be perfect. Gives them a little bit of a warning. We have a couple participants that just joined. Just, I'm just going to let them know that uh, participants are in breakout rooms and they are coming back within a couple of seconds and then we're going to keep moving on with our event. Good. Are we all back now? Yes. Good. I'll be back now. Welcome back, everybody. I, I hope it was good starting to talk to someone you might not 
known ahead of time. Um, and uh, hopefully you created a new connection and get to talk a little bit uh, about Hugo if you know anything about uh, the concept. As I said in the beginning, today I will hint at a correlation between Hugo and happiness. Um, I will start by talking about the word Hugo, and I will have you pronounce it with me as well so we can get it the, the right way. Um, then I will uh, talk uh, about what Hugo is as a concept and how it can be used and utilized in your everyday life. Then we'll talk a little bit about it in relation to the Scandinavian welfare state and then talk about um, happiness uh, and why Scandinavian is seen as such a happy place towards the end of my talk. And after that, there will be plenty of reasons, uh, plenty of time for questions, and you can already now plug questions into the uh, chat. The concept of Hugo has been everywhere in recent years, not just in Scandinavia or in Denmark, where it is part of the cultural national identity, but also really traveled outside uh, Denmark. Part of that is uh, Mike Viking's uh, best-selling book here, The Little Book of Hugo, that came out in 2016 and, and really led the way for a number of talks, articles, and cultural discussions of the concept of Hugo, or as he called it, the Danish way of living well. The word Hugo, if we want to do just a dictionary definition, right? It is here, as I have a quality of coziness and comfortable conviviality that engenders a feeling of contentment or well-being. And then importantly, regarded as a defining characteristic of Danish culture. The word itself, hygge, is pronounced hygge. And feel free to try to pronounce it with me. I'm going to say it four, four, four or five more times here now. Hygge. 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 You really have to do that. Almost like whistling. Hygge. Then the uh in the end. It contains all the sounds that make Danish such a hard language to pronounce. It's really easy language to speak and, and read, but pronoun, to pronounce, it is a very difficult language to do that. My definition of Hugo, as that will be the guide in my presentation here today, is pleasant togetherness. And when I talk about pleasant togetherness, it indicates two things. On one hand, like that we have an atmosphere, that's a pleasant, right? The components that make Hugo. And then also they have something that is social, the people that creating Hugo. That does not mean you can't Hugo on your own, by yourself with a book at home. But I think very central piece of it, as I see it at least, is the social aspect of it, uh, the people creating Hugo. I will return to this definition later and try to spell out both the atmosphere and the social, but first I want to look a little closer at the word. In Danish, the word hygge is used in so many different contexts. It is used as a verb, to hygge, which means to add hygge. We hygge us, we are having a hygge in time. And it's also used as a speech formula like hygge die, du må hygge die, similar to have fun in English. You can also use it as an adjective, det var hyggeligt, that was hyggeligt, or det er en hyggelig by, this is a hyggelig town, for instance. If you go to a dinner party or sup at someone, then when the next time you see them, you will typically say, det var en hyggelig aften, like that was a hyggelig night, and that's an indication that you had a really good time. It can also be used as fixed compound nouns, like an Hygge spreader, someone who spreads hygge. You can talk about a hygge night. You can talk about Christmas hygge, hygge chat, or you can talk about hygge musik. 
You can also use it as verbs here again in compounds like to hygge snakke, to hygge chat, to do Christmas hygge. And then one of my favorite here, like hygge nygge, which is nygge as a rhyming reduplication of hygge to create a cuteness effect. And then also we might want to say that we have the opposite, which is uhygge, which is creepy or hygge scary. And the reason why I want to start by naming all these ways that the word hygge is used is that the way it's embraced in Danish and Scandinavian cultures is by using and saying the word. By invoking the concepts, you kind of as invoke all the association that comes with it, right? You're sitting down and say, now I'm going to have a hygge time. Then you kind of put focus on what you're doing in this second. Uh, now we are going to have a hygge night together. Then you put focus on that concept. But where does the word come from? In, in a Scandinavian context. Well, it actually comes from Old Norse, as, as so many uh, Scandinavian words do, where it was hygge, which means mind or thinking, and then it moved from Norwegian, where it means we had hygelit, which means nice, and then into Danish, where it means cozy, comfortable, or, or content. And it wasn't until after you know, in the late 19th century, that the word hygge took up the connotations that we uh, have today. Um, that was in the context of the Second Schleswig War uh, in 1864, where Denmark, for fighting against uh, Prussia, um, and against the provinces of Schleswig, Holstein, and Launberg, were humiliated uh, in a battle um, that almost cost the country its independence. Uh, in this battle, most of the Danish army was uh, killed. 6,000 soldiers were killed or injured in a span of a few hours. Um, and after that, the Prussian army uh, took over a third of the country uh, and a quarter of the country's population. And this catastrophe did not come alone. On top of that, Danish export, which at the time was grain, uh, stagnated because the U.S. entered the European market with a grain that was better, much better quality than the Danish, and had a much lower price on top of it. So there was a crisis, both a national identity crisis and a financial crisis. And what do you do in situations like that? Well, what they did in Denmark at the time, they kind of sat down, right? Turned their back to the rest of the world. And the motto became, what outwardly has been lost, inwardly shall be gained. And it is in this environment this context that the idea of hygge as cozy contentment comes into being. We're good enough the way we are. We can shelter from the rest of the world. We don't need them. What is important is what we have here. And we need to find strength in our communities and our um, interactions with each other. So if this is how Hugo came into the significance and meaning it has in Danish culture today, I don't think in any way it is a coincidence that it uh, made its, um, that it, it became um, popularized outside Denmark in 2016. Um, in the context of Brexit. And in fact, Hugo was shortlisted from Word of the Year that year, 2016, but lost to both Brexit and to Trumpism, right? Trump that at that time at least ran on a platform about 
isolation, right, uh, from the rest of the world. So here too, it came into English and American culture at a time where there was a cultural sentiment of closing off towards the rest of the world. And with that, let me go back to my definition of Hugo as a pleasant togetherness, again, where we have the atmosphere, the components that make Hugo, and then the social, the people that create Hugo. The atmosphere, one thing we talk about here all the time, right, is the candles. And candles is really something that is important if when you want to create this cozy, inviting atmosphere. And people think that my wife and I are crazy, that when we tell them that we always use candles uh, when, we, when we have dinner, even when the, the kids were three, four years old and easily could, could, could fall over. It is just something that is part of us sitting down for dinner. The candles have to be on, at least in the darker months of uh, the year. What does it do? Right? It, it creates a more inviting, comfortable uh, atmosphere where you're more willing to sit and share and um, talk about what has happened uh, during the day. The next thing is indirect lighting. If you can see my slide here, the, the lamp that you see there um, is um, called uh, PH3 and uh, one of the most sold lamps in Denmark, designed in the 1920s by the architect Paul Henningsen. Uh, and let me tell you, it's not cheap. I think it's $800. But what is so unique about it is that it creates a complete, even, indirect light. At no mirror, in no angle, can you actually see the light bulb, but it only creates a nice, soft uh, light. Uh, and I think this is very much in, in, in opposition to what you will find typically, in, in at least in some American homes. I remember the first time I was going to visit my in-laws. They live in, uh, in San Diego, uh, and we were sitting down for dinner. And then just as we were about, like, the dinner was served, right, they turned on what I since had referred to as the stadium lighting, like those 100 bolted lights that just whoo, explodes and sheds light on everything, right, and kills. Don't worry, I, I love my in-laws very dearly. Um, but, but kills all attempts to make uh, atmosphere and, and prohibit you from sit and being intimate in your conversation right it's the purpose is clear you're sitting down because you want to eat and fill yourself up with food and and when that is done you get up right instead the indirect lighting right not as much lighting is more inviting to to the coziness and um, the talking about as i mentioned what has happened uh, during uh, the day um and I should tell you, I, I talked um, a few last year uh, in uh, at a public library here in uh, in Wisconsin called in, Rest, in a small town called Racine, it's ph phenomenal bakeries in Racine. They have a strong Danish heritage about the concept of uh, Hugo. And uh, a few weeks after, um, one of the participants sent me an email. She was a uh, middle school teacher. And she said, during research, she had always, re recess, she has always invited students to come in and sit in her office. And what she had done now, she had turned down the lighting, she had bought uh, plastic candles, and she had bought some board games, um, and it completely changed uh, the atmosphere. The students were more calm, uh, they were more confident, uh, and more willing to take chances and, and confide in, in each other. Uh, as part of that. So yes, the indirect uh, lighting is, is part of it. And then of course, the hot drink is, is something that uh, can see, be seen as, as an important component of, of Hugo uh, as well, simply because right, when you're sitting with, with a hot drink, really hot cup of uh, coffee, really hot cup of hot chocolate, the first thing you do, right, you're sitting like 
warming yourself on it, you're blowing on it. And it again, it creates a different connection with the people around you than actually sitting with a glass of water. And then two, I've said relax closing, but we don't necessarily have to push that uh, quite uh, as much. The other thing is the, the closeness, right? That when we are together and having a hygge, we're not necessarily sitting in each different room, part of the living room or the house, but we're trying to get together and sit round a table, sit so we can see each other, uh, have eye contact um, and, and talk to each other. In my family, in addition to the, to the candles, what we always do on the weekends is that we do what we have called eftermiddagskafte, afternoon coffee. And it's literally two, three in the afternoon, we will always have a snack together, right? My wife and I, a cup of uh, coffee, the kids maybe a glass of water, and maybe we will have a cookie, maybe we will have baked something, sometimes we we just have a cracker. But the importance is that we spend everything from three minutes, and sometimes it's only three minutes, but we can everyone get together, right? Up to, to 10 minutes where we just sit down, even though everyone else, like on a typical weekend, are all around the, the house, right? And uh, my kids are now, my, my youngest is seven, right? And But she's still very insistent on like, what are we going to do for afternoon coffee today? When are we going to have it? What are we going to eat? Right? It's something that has become such a big, big part of her. And it's a really good way just to just sit down for a tiny little bit in the, the afternoon. And then the friendliness um, as well, of course, is that you want to be encouraging. You want to small talk and invite people uh, to share and one thing you do that too right um, is that another thing that i've had to taught my 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 grand uh, my my sorry my uh, my in-laws is that when they're visiting right when they have finished dinner the first thing they do right they take the plate out and we have kind of taught them that it's it's okay just yes we might be done eating but we can still even though the kids have to go to bed, it's a busy night, we can still sit for two or three minutes and just and just talk, right? It is these occasions where we can actually be together. Let's just sit a, a little longer. That's what we can see there. And then we can come to the some of the aspects that are a little more problematic in a Danish context, right? That it is very much a middle class phenomenon when when we when we talk about Hugo is in a cultural context in in Danish. It's not something that you for instance can see in the lowest classes in society, mm -hmm. but it's also something that is used for social control of the richer. One of the meanest things you can say to someone in Denmark, and typically someone who's wealthy and wealth off, is that if you visit their house, you can say, oh, their house is not hygge, right? That it means it is just, it's too much, uh, and they have lost contact with that middle-class culture that is so uh, important. And that brings me, of course, right, to the, the next thing, which is the Scandinavian welfare system and why that is so important in relation to the concept of uh, Hygge. But before we do that, I'm just going to throw you into uh, groups once again. I'm sorry. I, I believe in group work and hopefully you can see this is also a way for you to get to talk to each other. And just to have two minutes to talk about and reflect about how you can integrate Hygge into your life, uh, or if you already do, perhaps unknowingly. Just from the few things I've said here, are the things that you can say, I can actually integrate that very easily into my life. And I'll have you go into to groups for a few 
uh, minutes if Sierra you want to do that and then I'll see you back here in three minutes. Sounds great. So I'm going to put everyone into their breakout rooms now. Again, breakout rooms are optional. You have the choice to go into the room or not, um, but we will push you in there now. Thank you, Sierra. No problem. So they've been in there about a minute. So we'll okay. give them another couple more minutes. Is that okay? To yes. Okay. Is this is has it been okay so far? Yeah, it, the, this is working wonderful. Okay, good. So when do you want me to finish? We have until 8.30. Okay, so, so 7.30 my time, yeah, okay. Yeah, so however much time you need, we usually give about a half an hour at the end for okay. a Q&A. Yeah. So what are we talking about? 25 minutes, yeah. So that's perfect, right? If it goes over, that's completely fine as well. Okay, I'm going to end the breakout room so that gives them a minute to come back. Klaus, we have a comment in the chat that says, I imagine that you discourage screen use during Huga family time. Yeah, should I wait with everyone is back? Yeah, sure. I when everyone comes back, I'll I'll say it again. Everyone's coming back in five seconds. Hey, everyone is back now. And we had a great comment in the chat, which says, I imagine that you discourage screen use during Huga time. And, and the answer to that is yes, of course we do. And it becomes harder and harder. And that's also why my my oldest is a, is a high schooler, a teenager. Uh, so, so, so of course with that, right, 
the time that we're sitting down together as a whole family becomes shorter because we really disencourage it. But I think it's also something that both of the kids have grown up with. So they know that at this time it is important that we don't have have any screen. And 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 I think it's it's as everything else, it's it's a learn learning process. Uh, and I think what is important is that I mean we as adult, right, we are oftentimes worse than uh, than the kids when it comes to screen use. Uh, so we just take the leads and make sure that we put the the phones in the the other rooms while we are sitting uh, down, right? And the lamp, I can see someone is also asking, can you remind me of the name of the lamp fixture? It's called PH5, um, and the architect is Paul Henningsen, P-O-U-L. Uh, H E N N I N G S E N. So that's the name of of uh, the lamp. And yes, you can you can buy it in uh, typically in in upscale um, um, design stores here in the U.S. as well. So I hope you had a good conversation. Uh, I hope you talked about how you could use some of these ideas. Uh, in in your life in an easily low stake way and and hopefully we can talk more about that in the q a but now i want to turn the discussion a little bit um because of course it's very easy to talk and say you just do this sit sit down find time to do this right everyone is busy everyone has a lot to do and everyone seems to be be struggling especially here post pandemic. So talking about these things is very much an aspect of privilege as well. And when it comes to, to the Scandinavian way of thinking, Google, right? I mean, that's where the welfare state comes in and play a important part. And the welfare state should, does not, I should add, right, provide welfare we often hear about it as a as a socialist state uh, socialist programs they are not they're put in place of course on one hand to help people but they're also mainly put in place to increase productivity right that you want people to uh, to work more and contribute more right the reason why you have free things like child care and long maternity leaves it is not because the scandinavians love mothers more than anyone else but in doing the the 70s women were needed in the labor market so with that of course it be, makes more sense that you have a uh, someone taking care of the a group of kids while someone is out working and the same with the very generous um uh, maternity and paternity leave arrangements that we hear from scandinavia now right up to a year sometimes even longer it's because the birth rates are low uh, so you want to make sure that people have have kids and you can continue and sustain the living you have but central of course to the the welfare state is the idea of of public uh, health care um, and that is important because one of the things right when you ask americans that is the biggest worry it is the cost of health care it is the fear of losing healthcare if you go from one job to another. So it also creates an inflexibility in the labor market where in, in a Scandinavian context, you know if you change jobs, you're not gonna lose your healthcare, right? Your family is not gonna lose it, it either. So it takes that worry out. And when worries like that are out, right, it becomes easier to sit down and relax and, and embrace uh, the Hugo together. The other thing is uh, flexicurity, like what's called the golden angle of, of flexicurity. And flexicurity is the idea that you have a very, very active labor market, but also strong social uh, uh, policies. That means that it's very easy to hire and fire people in Denmark much easier than in most european uh, countries and that means that you have a lot of people uh, often changing jobs that means if you do a have a startup company right 
they can hire not only the young 19 year old, but they might also be able to lure a 50 year old into to the workforce who is willing to take that chance. Because if something goes wrong, and that's the idea of flake security, right? You will, for a certain amount of time, right? number of months, you will get social benefits so you don't necessarily have to sell your house. Uh, and for number of jobs too, and that's the third component, right? You have active labor market policies and activation where uh, unemployment offices actively goes in and work with people to help them activate and find new jobs. So that's the, the, the idea there uh, as well. And the, the idea with, with all of this, right, and we can add college to it as well, right, is that we have in, in Scandinavia, Denmark specifically, you have a very, very different work-life balance than here in, in, in the US. Here you can see the OECD countries on this one here, um, where uh, work-life balance is pointed out. And, and in, as you can see here, Denmark is at the top of the list with the best work-life balance, where the US is the uh, lowest. Because if you are afraid constantly of losing your job, because you know losing your job means you will lose your health care, you will lose your house, then you're probably also going to work a little harder, at least spend an hour extra at the job, without not, as it, not necessarily without being more productive. Whereas in Denmark, you want to go home so you can make sure to pick up the kids um, before it's too late. So that's the importance of the welfare state that creates that privilege in, in the mid middle class to embrace uh, Hygge. And then the final component here I want to talk about here, right? And that is the linking to happiness. As you probably all have heard, right? Scandinavian countries uh, almost always come out on the top of the world happiness reports. And we'll talk a little later about what the world happiness report is. In the recent years, right, Finland has been on the top of that list. Um, the most recent one, Finland is on the top, then Denmark, and then Iceland. But typically, it is the Scandinavian countries that uh, come out on the top of this list. So what does this mean? Does this mean that Scandinavians, Finns, or Danes, I've lived six years in Finland, so I can speak a little to, to, to Finns as well, that they go around and are happy all the time? I can tell you they're not. And and for a long time, I since I've been living outside at least Denmark for a long time, uh, I was typically visiting during the summer when the weather is nice and, and you see people smiling and being happy, right? And I'm there on vacation and we're having fun. So you felt like, yeah, people are happy. But then last year I visited in, in November and that was just a good reminder of how miserable uh, it is uh, and how grumpy people uh, also can be despite the fact that they're the second happiest people in in the world i was in a in a small town in the peninsula of of, of jotland um, and it was raining and it was dark uh, and it was mid late afternoon and i went into uh, one of the stores right and people were just busy and they were grumpy so there was no happiness. And while I was there, and that was what I wanted to share with you now, is actually one of my favorite poems um, about what it, November is like in, in Denmark. And the poem goes like this. It's by the poem, poet uh, Henrik Norbrand, and it is called The Year Has 16 Months. And it goes like this. The year has 16 months. November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, and here it comes, November, 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 November. And I don't think there's any better way of expressing just how miserable uh, it, it actually can be in November in Scandinavia. Yet, from a Danish perspective, right, we like to talk about ourselves as a happiness superpower. I think this is because 
Denmark has rated number one on the World Happiness Report uh, for so many years, and now is at a second and sometimes a um, third. And I think it's because when we talk about happiness, right, we have to talk about two kinds of happiness. We have to talk about effective happiness on one hand, right? The effective happiness is if I had gone up to any of those things, being so grumpy because it was November and it was rainy and it was late afternoon and said, so how are you feeling, right? They'd be like, I'm tired, right? The, the same that I at least used to feel at six o'clock in the morning with my uh, my daughter was 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 screaming, right? If anyone had come up and asked, so are you happy? I'm like, no, go away, right? So we need to talk about happy on, on some different terms. And that's what they do in the, um, in the World Happiness Report, right? They talk about cognitive happiness. And here they ask people to think of a ladder with the best possible life for you being a 10 and the worst possible life for you being a zero. And then they ask people, rate your current life. And then they add, adjust slightly uh, for um, things like uh, equality, um, freedom of press, um, corruption, and other things. And they ask about it. Is they it's Gallup? They ask these things for the for the UN, and they ask about a thousand people a year uh, in in each uh, of the countries these questions and this is what puts together the world happiness report is it perfect no of course it's not but it is a much better indication of what we had earlier when we talked about how people were doing in in different countries before the world happiness uh, report one of the ways that the well-being of a population was measured was um, by GDP per capita. And as we all know, right, that is really not a good way of measuring it. If we look at, I mean, the richest country, GDP per capita in, in the world, right, it's Switzerland, it's Norway, uh, but, uh, but then I, I believe that, um, what is it, is it QA that comes in at number three uh, or one, um, one of the Middle Eastern countries, right, where we know at least there's there's someone that has a lot, but there are a lot of people who do not have a much lot. So GDP per capita is not necessarily uh, the best uh, measure of that. So what it is it that brings happiness, right? What is it that these reports tell us about uh, happiness and what makes people happy? Whoop, let me see here. Done. And that's three things, right? It's community, it is friendship, and togetherness. And as you can see, and I hope from now it starts making a little sense, this is something that is really central to the idea of Hugo as well, right? That we actually engage with, with the people, talk, and we feel a sense of community either in our family, in where we live, or in, 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 in our jobs. Unfortunately, of course, some of you probably know uh, Robert Putnam's book, I think it came out in 2001, Bowling Alone, uh, that, that, that what we see the trend in, in the US is that we see m less and less of community and uh, togetherness, but more and more people uh, spending time alone. The title, The Bowling Alone, refers to the fact that, that Putnam observed how um, there were more people bowling in the U.S. And than ever before, but fewer bowling leagues. In other words, many people actually went bowling alone, right? And that is a figure that he works on here with that book. And other things he he he, he talks about. Um, he talks about how we as a country uh, have moved from what he calls. Uh, bridging social uh, capital to bonding social uh, capital. And bridging social capital, right, that means that if you, for instance, are living in a middle class uh, society, 
white society than pre previously. You might have gone through a school where you were exposed to people from different backgrounds. You might have been in the military when there was a draft, right, that exposed you to people from significantly different circumstances. But what we have seen today is a move from that bridging social capital, right? And the bridging social capital, of course, means that when you have an understanding for someone, you also care more about different viewpoints to a, but the move have been to a bonding social capital where we now instead, right, surround ourselves with people who think, look, uh, and, and, and act like, like us, right? I live here in, in Madison, which is a, a college town. I live about a little less than a mile from, 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 from campus in, in, in an old neighborhood. And most houses here are from the 1910s to the 1940s. Uh, and it's an area known as the, the professor ghetto. Um, and I probably don't have to tell you what I, but I think most of my, my colleagues vote. And it might not probably come as a surprise to you that like that half the cars on my, my block are Subaru Outbacks as well, right? Everyone thinks the same, drives the same, votes the same. That means that when we send our kids to school, right? My kids goes to school with kids of professors or uh, doctors or lawyers who all people who have the same outlook on the world, right? So they certainly don't get, they get the, Bonding, but they don't get the bridging social capital, right? That is very much what. Sorry, that was a detour, um, but um, but that is certainly what we see now. But community, friendship, and togetherness is 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 really central. And unfortunately, right, one of the things that you when you ask um, people um, and the age, between the age of eighteen and thirty four, twenty two percent of them say that they have no one they feel they can depend on. They have many acquaintances, as we would call it earlier, right? Now they are called friends on social medias, uh, but they don't have any really good friends. They don't have that bonding, that feeling of a network, of a community that is so important. And what, and I know there's people here from the medical profession that can probably correct me on this, right? But at least what I have read is that loneliness has a strong impact on our well-being, right? And it supposedly has the same effect on our mortality as smoking 50 uh, cigarettes uh, a day. So I think that's why the reason, right, when, you, when we talk about uh, Hugo, when we talk about happiness, like finding and reaching out to people when we eat or when we drink. I sit most days in my office and eat lunch alone. And my colleagues sit next door to me and do the exact same, right? And we're so bad at reaching out and saying, why don't we just sit together and sit and talk for five minutes? Why don't we go for a cup of coffee? And that can even be in online as well, right? It makes a difference if we have these small day-to-day uh, -day interactions uh, with someone. And I think it's really telling that we all probably know, right, the, the food pyramid here and have heard quite a, a lot about that. And I know there's even some, there's some controversy about it. But what I've learned recently is that in France, they have this food pyramid, but they also have comes with the recommendation that you should never eat alone, that the social aspect of it is really important. So that is one thing uh, you can do. So what about the something else? Well, can't you just, if you can't buy happiness, can't you buy some wine? That will pretty much take, take care of it. At least there we know too, right, that when it comes to conspicuous consumption, as it's called, that does not do anything for our happiness. But that doesn't mean that if you have the means that you can actually do something with, to, um, to build your, your happiness. You can buy more time. And buying time is, is pretty simple, right? If you, if you have a family, uh, and again, this is if 
if you're privileged, have the means, you can hire a babysitter. You can hire someone to take care of the, the yard and you can spend that time in, in with, with, with your, your family. You can also buy experiences and memories, right? That will be something you can take a photo of and hang up uh, on, on the wall and will remind you of what has happened. And then you can buy small treats. Just tell yourself, yeah, I'm not going to go in and buy a coffee every day, but each Friday on my way to work, I will go in and get that specialty coffee that I really like. And then also you can do what is called pay now, consume later. You can buy tickets to the symphony concert and exhibition and then talk about it with whoever you're going with, right? And that increases your both your expectations and also um, um, your, your happiness when it comes to that. You have someone to share with. And then finally, giving to others is also something that we know can maximize uh, happiness and you can do when, uh, when it comes to money. So with that, I just want to finish uh, by saying embrace Hugo. It might just make you happier. And then I will be happy to take uh, whatever questions uh, you, you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Klaus. This has been amazing. And I know I personally am taking away strategies that I'm going to prioritize. Um, so the way that we can do the Q&A, please feel welcome to come off mute if you have any questions or you can put them into the chat and I can ask your question for you. So if you have your hand raised, please feel welcome to come off mute and ask your questions. We're getting quite a few thank yous in the chat. This was yeah, a wonderful you. presentation. I can see someone write, wrote down the yeah the oh Sierra you wrote down the name yeah. of the of the lamp so people can can look that up right. And again, I mean the price of that lamp speaks to the the privilege of of the concept of of, of Hugo right that it is uh, embraced in such an important way. Yes, I can go back to that uh, slide. And when you get to the slide about the books, is there a particular one on there that you would recommend for a first Huga book? Boop, 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 boop. Uh, am I sharing now? I'm not, right? No, not yet. Okay, let me just do that here. Yes, uh, I would say the, the the one here in the middle, which is a coffee table book. It's a tiny little book, the little book of Hugo, but it's it's formative and it's it's a quick read and it uh, has some good example. I I think is 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 still the best uh, that has come out. Mike Viking, uh, uh, and it's I know it's a W, but it's pronounced in Danish with a single V. Mike Mike Vikings, the little bo book of of Hugo, I think is 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 the best one. Um, unfortunately, they're not that longer, more engaged uh, books. That if you want a more um, elaborate view of, of Hugo, uh, those are really not. In, in existence uh, so far. Um, but there's some some academic articles too, if you would be interested in, in, in that. We have another question in the chat that says, can you describe how a shared sense of history and identity plays into the feeling of Huga? That is a really, really good uh, question, right? But it's also a very complex uh, question. A shared sense of, what was it, hi history and? A 
a shared identity. sense of history and identity and how that plays into the feeling of Huga. I mean, this is where it, of course, becomes tricky, right? Because the the when when you look at a country like Denmark or Scandinavia today, uh, but let's 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 take take Denmark, right? It's very easy to think about it as as a homogenous uh, monolingual uh, country. Um, uh, that is a relatively new uh, invention. Uh, the provinces that were lost in the war in 1864 were mainly uh, German speaking. Uh, and the Danish king at the time hardly spoke a, Dan a word of, of Danish. Um, so when we talk about it and think about it, something that is important to, to the cultural identity, right? This is a construction uh, that happened in the wake of that war as well and that's where i will claim that the concept of who became important in 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 that regard another um aspect and that's in terms of, of of identity right that we've seen ourselves as this small little tried country that is then things would like it being the center of europe but it's really not right uh, but used to be important uh, used to have significance in, in, the, in the world uh, and just the sheer fact like the Baltic Sea if you know that area right I mean Denmark used to possess all the countries around it um, at, at one point uh, that the story of the country is that it's just gotten smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller uh, and and with that is the idea that it's us against the world so that is that is central to the idea of national uh, identity. The other thing in terms of history, I think very tangible, simple for the history is the um, is the fact the fact that it's a uh, kingdom, right? There's a, a queen. Uh, it's a representative democracy still, right? And the queen has no power whatsoever. Uh, but it creates a very tangible, concrete history, right? That the the queens great 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 grandfather was that king and the royal family goes back to year eight no sorry year 970 like there's been some twists and turns but it's more or less the same family that's been sitting in the throne for for that long and and i think that's something that creates a uh consistence when it comes to history and the understanding of national history um and and one of the reasons why the the monarchy despite us living in the 21st century is so extremely popular i hope that was uh yeah helpful oh here's a is this the next question uh the is Huga concept incorporated into healthcare in denmark uh, specifically within in hospital care. I let me give you. I, I'll actually use the example of Finland here because I lived six, as I said, I've lived six years in in Finland, and um, my first child or son was born in Texas, and our daughter was born in Finland, and being when he was born in Finland, right? As we all know, at a hospital you have a medical doctor there it's a medical procedure at least that was how what what it felt like being there when my my wife gave gave birth but in in finland you don't have a doctor present uh, you have midwives uh, and 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 then as my wife was about to give birth like they turned down the light in the room and kind of created this really cozy atmosphere and they started whispering and and it was most like we were still in a hospital uh, and yes we knew there was a doctor down the hallway if, if, if anything went, went wrong right but it was very very different and the second my daughter was born instead of the do here take it away right she was put on on my wife we got to hold her and and wash her in the room and then they carted in a little little table from for my wife and I with like 
champagne glasses with uh, with um, apple juice and 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 some snacks like 15 minutes later and a candle if I, I I remember it correctly. So I think that's where you see see part of it. Another aspect of it um, is that you would never, if you go to your general uh, physician in, in 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 Denmark, they never meet you in white coats, right? It's a very relaxed. The the offices that you come into is they're not like a living room, uh, but they they don't they don't feel quite as sterile as as they they do here, um, and you will almost always be on a first name basis, and they will insist on that first name basis, and of course that creates a sense of equality and and welcomeness, but it also creates some problems, right? Because it hides some some structures. Uh, of power structures that that sometimes can be good to to be made more uh, explicit. So yes, the concept is certainly integrated into um, some of the public institutions uh, as well, in, in including uh, healthcare. Did I miss any questions, Sierra? I don't believe so. There was one comment about one of the slides with the saying, what is lost on the outside is gained on the inside. Yes. I... Was there a comment about that? It was, it was just, they were just asking, um, could you go back to the slide that had that on it? And then we do have one more question too, as you're looking at that slide, does HUGA preclude familial conflict? Absolutely not. Uh, uh, no, no. And I think that that's the, the answer, right? And and I think some of the, the books, and I think that's where my, my Vikings book is doing a better job than the others, right? We'll say that, 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 that HUGA is also a, a non-political um, space. Um, and if if you know Scandinavians, they love discussing politics. Uh, and and of course, here in the U.S., discussing politics have become increasingly difficult uh, because you you tend to if you if you disagree with someone these days, right? You tend to really disagree, uh, and and. Um, but in, in Scandinavia, it can also be the, the small things that separate views. And, and then you like it's just discussing that uh, all night. And the same, of course, in, in families uh, as, as well, right? I mean, my son is a teenager. Of course, we have conflicts, right? It, the, the fact that we try to eat together every day, the fact that we do all these things do not um, pre uh, preclude that. So. And then another question in the chat, do you have any recommendations for how to integrate this concept into this culture with awareness about certain inherent obstacles? This is the quote people were looking for, right? Can it be seen now on the slide? Um, it's not sharing just yet. Okay, it's not sharing, so let me just do that. One of the things I would I like to to um, to recommend, right? I mean, I live in the Midwest, and the Midwest is up here. It's 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 pretty dark, uh, and I know it can be really dark in Connecticut too. I was in Connecticut in late October this year, uh, and and it, it it was pretty it got dark relatively early as well, right? Um, and I think there is this tendency to when it's dark outside, we need to create more light inside um, and kind of fight the, the darkness of, of the season. And I think one of the things we can do with Hugo, right, is, is to uh, embrace the darkness. It doesn't mean that we should all just sit in darkness in our, in our living rooms, right? But say this is actually also just a season, a time of year when, when, when we create that coziness uh, inside uh, where we put on a a, a nice uh, sweater um, 
and and where we we turn the lights down uh, a little bit and saving a little bit of energy is not the worst thing both in terms of the climate and also just because energy prices are, are, are really going up so so that 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 is 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 one way um, of doing it and then i think it is the 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 small things um other things you can in, integrate it into your, the culture right sit down if if you live with other people right make sure you talk to them every day sit down actually at a table uh in in engaging for a a few uh, minutes or if not try to to reach reach out um the times and uh, the new york times had a couple of weeks ago a challenge that was called seven days of happiness i don't know if any of you you read that um and it gave people a lot of instruments what are the things that we should do and one of the things were a what it was called an eight minute conversation call someone and up talk to them for eight minutes a friend you haven't talked to a long time make sure you keep your social connections uh, alive i think is an, another aspect of of hugo uh, as well that was not a particularly good answer but i hope it was sufficient Oh, this is a great question. How might animals and pets be a part of Huga? That is a, 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 a good question. First of all, I don't know enough about the, the research on, on pets and, uh, on, and happiness, right? What the, the, the correlation uh, is there. Um, but I would say, right, I mean, if pets animals are an integrated part of your life then then they should not be ex excluded from the situation of creating hygge, right they they will, will i assume will always be integral and 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 part uh, and part of it um whether you have someone over right and and you have your pets being part of that right because pets are also really good at creating connection, creating conversation and creating bonding uh, between uh, someone when you have a pet between you. So that's that's just what I can think of at the top of my head. But, but I guess uh, your response to this is probably better than mine. Oh, that is wonderful to hear. Someone used essential oils, and the company we have uh, the use called blend is called Hugo. So that was a that's like a that's a great smell. I'm glad to hear that. I'm not affiliated with them, I should say. Just the This has been so wonderful. Just give it another minute in case anyone has any last minute questions. But I think it's very clear from the chat and the participation here today. Uh, Dr. Anderson, this has been an amazing um, event. Uh, I feel very grateful that you came and spoke with our group today and, and personally taking away many of these strategies and making them an important part of my family's daily routine. <laughs> So thank you so much. I'm not seeing anything else come through the chat. Um, so I hope everyone has a really wonderful evening. And Klaus, we can't thank you enough for being here and, and sharing thank, your Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for sitting through. And uh, thank you for your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great night. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
much. Awesome. I appreciate it.